it's all pre-taped. Was, but let me back up to my dad again, fire station number eight. He told me about the fact that when the pay for the firefighters was not being um, considered by the board, and this was still before integration, uh-huh. the integration started in the early to mid sixties in the county around the different programs. Um, it started first in the fire department. Um, they're one of the first departments that got to do it. Then they kind of rolled over to the parks department. Um, I didn't even know where Lover Run was, much less whether or not they had um, programs that I could go to. And and so when I wanted to learn things like um, first aid and stuff like that, instead of maybe going to um, maybe some of the health services clinics and things, mm-hmm. I did it at the YMCA or they did it there at the Red Cross, there right, right. off of Arlington Boulevard. Uh-huh. You cut down before you hit George Mason. And, and so, I mean, so a lot of things that other communities very comfortably, very freely were able to participate in, we were not. So when it came to this pay issue, I can't remember which fire station it was that reached out to the guys at fire station number eight. And with my dad being the first captain up there, um, they said, you know, Ogden County might be willing to do it for us, but if you guys, if you Negroes would come down and kind of get on this <laughs> picket line with us with a sign, um, that'll make them want to do this much, much more quickly. Now, it's always kind of been like a bruising kind of place because when the county start first stipends and then hiring and paying the firefighters, mm-hmm. it was a full 10 years before the Black firefighters up at station number eight even got that. They did hit all the other white volunteer stations in the county. Mm -hmm. So to quote unquote be asked to come help us get a raise for everybody, my dad and the firefighters were always kind of amused about that. Oh, now you can use them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How do you want us? That's it. That's that it. And, and the still not to help us, really to help you. Yeah. Exactly. But anyway, you know, put a little more fire on the fire, so to speak. Right. We will let that happen. When they did integrate, um, and my dad became the first paid fire captain that was a Negro um, in the sort of public service, protective um, fire department um, activities here in the county, one of the white firefighters wrote on the board that he wasn't going to work under this nigga. And um, my dad left it on the board. It was like a chalkboard, not a whiteboard that you have now that anybody probably would have erased, but he said, well, if they got that kind of ball, you know, let it stay out there. That's not who I am. That's not what I am. And I'm still the captain and they better follow my orders. Wow. Wow. But somebody called one of the chiefs. It would have been a battalion chief at that point, whose name I don't remember. And that battalion chief came up and he cleaned off that board. He said, who did it? He found out who did it. And he really read him the old ride act, so to speak. He mm-hmm. said, this is your captain. Now, if you don't know that, I'm telling you, the old read my lips. If anything like this happens again, you're going to be fired. No kidding. Wow. And I'm going to see that to it that you're fired. So, you know, fix your mind and share it with your fellows. We're not going to put up with that in Arlington County. Good. Now, Good. that was the right thing to do. But the reality was when the black firefighters began to be assigned to the other um, fire stations. People wouldn't eat off the plates that they used. Uh They didn't want to sleep in the bunks where they might have slept. And one of them was actually assigned to sleep on the fire truck on the fire hoses that were wrapped. And and that's where he had to sleep. And so we began to see things evolve. So we grew up with that. Fire Station 8 was also the place that was our safe space. Mm -hmm. Didn't have a whole lot of um, kids at risk because so many of us were in two-parent families and mama stayed home and raised the kids. Sure. And daddy went out to work. So we didn't have that kind of scenario. But we did have um, missing a bus or not getting back in time. And it wasn't a bus to go to school. The bus that I took right there by Langston McDonald's there on Lee Highway was to go into Georgetown to learn how to swim. 
because uh -huh. we couldn't swim in the pools here in Arlington County, okay? Uh -huh. um, missing that bus was me, again, going into DC to go to a movie theater because we couldn't go to the movie theater here in Arlington County where the um, credit union is right now. They're oh, on Lee Highway, yeah. where the, it's a pizza place down there and a paint yeah. store down there and okay. Pie for Life, I know the name of that one. Um, you know, those things, I couldn't go. And again, I could not go to that theater in Arlington County. I think it was called The Glee. It was, you know, the Glee. that's when I saw A Hard Day's Night. Okay. Before. That's it. Oh, yeah. I mean, that whole, it was, um, they were called neighborhood theaters. So there, there you the go. Reed, the Jefferson, the Buckingham, the yep. State, the Bird. That's and, it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in those places. There you go. But I couldn't go. I did get to go in 1967. And the reason that one stays in my head is that I took my daddy to see um, Dirty Dozen, I think it was. Oh, or rather, he took me. But he laughed. He had a great time. Um, that was the only time that I think I actually went to that movie with my dad. Everything else, we went into D.C. to see it. So to try to create those things. So last week, we buried John Lewis. Yep. And uh, a remarkable person by anyone's definition. But just share a little bit of what John Lewis and his legacy means to you. Well, John, for us... Um, here in the D.C. metropolitan area would always be um, associated with um, Martin Luther and the Civil Rights March in 63 and all that stuff. Okay, I think I finally turned it off. Um, it's going to be associated with Martin Luther King and the March and the Civil Rights and all of that kind of thing. So there were so many people um, Reverend Lowry, Re Reverend Vivian. I mean, there was just so many people that were names that we knew were involved in helping to make things better for everyone. We never really felt like it was for the colored people. Uh -huh. It was things that got it what was wrong with how anything was working if everybody wasn't being treated the same. Right. And that was so much of what that filter was. Um, I do remember in Washington Lee, we tried to get a chapter of SNCC going. Oh, gosh. And, and, and a lot of us said, oh, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, yeah. um, oh, why do we want to do this again? So, so you had to start sort of sorting things out. But that's where, you know, what John Lewis was about and, and, and uh, Claiborne and all of those kinds of things that we were going, well, since we weren't anchored in HB, Hoffman, Boston, where there would have been a natural segue into historical Black colleges sure. and universities, we didn't have that same mindset, thinking, and orientation. Uh -huh. That's kind of the B part of the answer. The A part of the answer, we have been so marshaled the last five, six years to integrate that anything that would seem to interfere with that, it was just not a very um, acceptable, comfortable place for us to be that were my age and younger. My older brothers, they didn't have a problem with it. They got to go to the march. They got to sneak out of the house. They got to do those kinds of things. But it was not something that was necessarily on my horizon that I felt comfortable and safe to be involved in. Okay. Okay. Um, I still have to own the fact that I'm still my parents' daughter and I obeyed the rules. So yes. if they told me not to do it, don't do it, it wasn't a big question for me. Sure. Um, I never snuck out of the house. I wasn't gonna climb down a ladder to go out and meet my friends and go drinking. Right. Didn't wanna do that. That wasn't the way that I was raised. Right. And don't laugh, Diane. As soon as I got into the integrated schools, I learned how to drink beer, okay? okay. <laughs> it just didn't happen. Well, one of my classmates, I can remember his face. He lived over in North Wakefield I Street, I think, something like that, here off of Old Dominion, here in Lehigh area. And we would actually go into town. Oh, why can't I remember the name of the liquor store? But, but what was so funny was his uniform. He'd get his dad's pipe. He'd get his dad's ascot. He'd get his dad's hat. He'd put on his glasses. He'd drive the car, and he'd go in. And, and I was the lookout. 
So I just kind of sat in the car there in Georgetown, whatever that liquor store was on them street. And um, if anybody came, I would hit, I would blow the horn. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, but other than that, if my parents knew I did that, they'd spank me even yet today uh, <laughs> for yeah. being involved no, in that. I, I understand. I, I wasn't allowed to go and join the protests for the Vietnam marches. Same reason. Wasn't allowed to get on the bus. Wasn't allowed to go. Um, this is an election year. You've worked in the, the election office. There's been a yep. lot in the media about the safety of the elections. And I would just, as we wind up, and I just have one more question after this one, what can we say, what can you say to the citizens of Arlington that will assure them that their vote is safe? Four things. The first thing is, um, the Commonwealth required several years back, and I won't remember the number now, that we all have to vote by paper. And mm -hmm. so those concerns that someone can get into a machine and manipulate votes or eliminate votes or change votes, it doesn't happen that way. Paper. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and the scanning machines that we use to record votes on paper it literally takes a photographic image of both sides of every single ballot. And so you can literally have not only a hard copy, but you have a photographic electronic copy, if you will, that if you have to match all 150,000 of them, it might take you a while to do the mansion, right. but you can get there. Right. Right. So that's, that's the first thing, safety, the method in which we actually do vote. I think the second thing that makes it safe is the sworn elected officials. We know that this is a constitutional right in this country that we take an oath to protect. And to the best of our ability that we do it, we do it fairly, and we do not disenfranchise or hinder anyone from exercising that vote. Mm -hmm. That becomes extremely important because if you don't vote, it can't get counted. Yeah, right. The third thing is every ballot is counted. Here in Arlington, the entire Commonwealth, quite frankly, it's not we only count the absentee ballots if there is a percentage differential that may or may not be too close to call it. Everyone gets counted. So when those polls close at 7 p.m. on election day, that absentee ballot component of the polls, it closes as well. Mm -hmm. And because the absentee component covers all of the poll locations that we have, those of us that would be in precinct 001 that voted absentee, we get counted. Okay. Those mm -hmm. that voted in precinct 054, yours gets counted also. Okay. So everything is recorded by that way. So you don't ever have to worry whether or not that's it. And then I think the fourth thing is the citizens of Arlington County hold us extremely accountable, whether individually or through their party, quote unquote, representation. And although we don't register by party in the Commonwealth, if you are a voter, you can vote for any election that's going on. That's right. You're not restricted. And, and so, but the parties, they quote unquote monitor the election activity. So if someone that is familiar with who they are or very active in the parties, whether it's the Republican, the Democratic, the Green, the Independent, whatever it is, they call those representatives and say, well, I went to precinct 001 and I tried to vote and this is what they told me. Or I asked a question and, and it seemed like they didn't want to answer my question. They answered other people's question. They didn't want to answer mine. Those kind of situations immediately, even during an election day, will get reported. They'll get reported to our general registrar, Gretchen Ronemeyer, or they'll even get reported to the commissioner there in Richmond, Virginia. And they stay in constant contact throughout that entire situation so that if there is something that is operating, that is preventing, prohibiting, or blocking people to exercise their constitutional right to vote, somebody's on it like immediately mm -hmm. and we get it done. So it's your right to do it. 
We take an oath to make sure that it happens. There are people that track and monitor when there may be a hiccup or even something being done wrong. And then there's an immediate response in order to get at it. Mm -hmm. What is most interesting for me, having been working in elections in this county for over 20 years, is that a lot of time voters don't want to take the time. Mm -hmm. The thing that I think complicates it for us here in Arlington, because we are in the, the old DMV, DC, Maryland, and Virginia, and we hold different elections at different times, when something goes out on the news media, they think that, oh, Arlington must be having an election. Well, it's actually a DC election yeah. or a Maryland election. Right. right. So the thing that I think we need to continue to improve and do better is educate the voter. Be very, very proactive in letting them know this is our election and this is our election now. Mm -hmm. The thing that we don't get to overcome is what parties may choose to do because the state code allows them to create their slate of candidates that they wanna put forward through different methods. We don't always control it. So for example, the one they did for the school board uh -huh. um, here this um, cycle, this election cycle, we didn't run that. The party ran that. And so people are saying, why didn't I get my ballot? I wanted to vote for school board. And then we have to say, well, actually, um, it is something that the party was running. It is not something that the um, general registrar's office was running. Okay. But again, that's back to education. And all of that education burden just isn't on us there in the registrar's office. It's the community sure. that sure. next door network, if you will, um, the League of Women Voters, um, the various parties. We just have to do better to inform because anything that looks like you might be trying to stop me, um, when people don't have the information, they make it up to inform themselves. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. And, and so we just, we just all have to work at that. We have to continue to work at that. Well, I'm hoping to be a poll worker yet again. I think it's a, um, an incredible experience and learned a lot. And it's, you know, it's about giving back in a really important way. That's so, right. This has been delightful. I want to close with just one kind of fun question. I'm wondering... Okay. You've had a terrific career. You've done a lot of different things. You've had your own business. You've worked for the EEOC. You've been in elections. You're um, a delightful person and you've witnessed a lot. What would you, from this vantage point, say to your, say, 12 or 13 year old se uh, self as you entered Swanson uh, Middle School Junior High for the first time? Good old Junior High. Um... I think what I would have said to my 12 year old self and I, my daddy, as you know, is such a strong influence in my life. My brother was taller than I and we had to walk to Swanson together. Mm -hmm. I wish I had longer legs, I'll be perfectly honest. Because he walked to school, I ran to school, just trying to keep up with him, okay? In order to do that. Um, and the other thing about my 12 year old self, even though I would have loved to go into Hoffman, Boston, I know that from the bottom of my soul, but I'm glad my parents made me do that because it helped me to develop that positioning commitment to give back. Mm -hmm. Somebody had to make the way. Somebody did have to be first. Some people had to pay with skin, blood, and life. And for my 12-year-old self to say, okay, I pouted about it, but I'm glad I did it. Mm -hmm. I think that's where I could end up. That's that's about as much fun as I can get out of that and learning how to drink beer. Uh, that alone, but but seriously, this is, um, I love talking with you. I could do this at least a couple of times a week. Uh, I learned something new, but it's, it's again, we, we grew up around the same time, very different experiences, but I think it's so terrific that we found each other all these years. Yeah, we did through the History Task Force uh, here yep. at the library and, uh, and got to know each other. And yep. uh, I, I just think you're terrific. I have enormous respect for you and what you've done and, uh, and what your, your very courageous uh, father did. So we will end it here and look forward okay. to talking again and vote, get out the vote.
Absolutely. It well, takes well, all of us to get this done. You, we got to so, get it. So we've come to the end, and I do have to say thank you so much. I'm very honored to be here. I'm glad we got to work together. I'm glad we got to know and enjoy each other. I'm glad we got to find out where our similarities are greater yes. than any differences that we can bring yes. um, and that we have enriched each other. And I thank you for that, Diane. Back You're at cool you, sister. Back, <laughs> back at you. And thank you, and we'll see you next time. Okay.